Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Nahalat Yeshua Congregation, Jesus Inheritance. We are welcoming you here and happy that you all can join us. We're happy that we can all come together in one heart and one spirit and bless the Father's name. So as our tradition, every second Saturday of the month, we want to congratulate everybody who have a special day in uh, September, in the month of September. So in this month, uh, the people who have a special day, a birthday, it's uh, David Figueras, Eva Kisluk, Mark, uh, and Jonathan and Melissa, who both have their birthdays this month. And as well, we have a couple weddings that happened in the September. So first of all, it's Jakob and Luba, so we want to congratulate you. And we want to congratulate our, our uh, new couple, our new wedded couple, uh, Tal and Eden, that just got married in the beginning of this month. So we want to congratulate you and may God bless you and accept this virtual flower from us. So today we'll continue to read from the book of Daniel uh, as our series goes. And today we are reading from chapter 11. So we want to pray to God that he will put his wisdom and spirit on Howard that he will share with us uh, what God put on his heart. And we also want to pray for the upcoming week because in the news we could have seen that we might be going back into quarantine so and the lockdown. So may God hand and God will will be uh, upon it. So let's pray and bless the Lord together and the worship team will bring us in front of the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we can come in front of you and be in one heart, in one spirit, and accept your guidance, accept your wisdom, and just praise your name. We bless the worship team and we bless the Pastor Howard that will lead us in this uh, sermon today. And we also want to pray for our government and all who made the decisions. Put your hand upon them, put the, your wisdom upon them. You in control, and we know that you know how to deal with the situation the best. So we put everything into your hands and we know that the best outcome will come with your glory, Father God. So we bless the sermon and bless our time together and may your spirit come upon us. In Yeshua's name I pray, amen. Shabbat Shalom, Keila Yakara, Bo Nehalel Yeshua Adon Haboka Hazer.
Shalom to everyone. What, how good it is to sing to our Lord, praise Him for the victory that we have in Him forever in Jesus Christ, the victorious one. And this is what Daniel also shows us, that the victory is God's. It belongs to Him. 
and he's sharing it with us. Hallelujah. Uh, what a wonderful God and Savior we have. Today we're going to begin chapter 11 in Daniel. We're only going to cover the first four verses. I, I call this uh, the chapter, actually, what was will be or uh, back to the future. Okay. So I'm not going to read uh, the verses from uh, uh, Daniel here, but I will read a couple of other verses. As we saw in chapter 8, and also here in chapter 11, God gives many details that Daniel writes for us, that in those prophecies with these details, there is short-term fulfillment of 100 years, and there's long-term fulfillment over, a thousand, over thousands of years. But the, but the long-term fulfillment is the fulfillment of the prophecies, and Jesus has told us that every jot and tittle of the law and the prophets will be fulfilled, not just a part of them. This is important for us to remember as we read these prophecies as well. Both chapters give lots of uh, specific details about the kings of Persia and of, and of, and of Alexander the Great uh, and of Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes. But both chapters of 8 and 11 primarily are looking to the time of the end, the last days, okay, at the time when the Antichrist will rise and his large army and his wars and his blasphemies against Jesus and against the people of God, whether they be Jews, you know, Israel, or Christians. So this, and this precision that is in Daniel 8 and Daniel uh, 11, and in the rest of the book too for that matter, this precision has given critics of the Bible uh, in general, and of Daniel in particular, uh, to say that Daniel the prophet could not be the writer of his own book. You know, these people, as I think I said a few weeks ago, they, they do not understand prophecy or the God who is the God who knows everything from the beginning to the end, from first to last. They say also the events were written about after they happened. In other words, again, hundreds of years later, but there's still events to happen that have not yet occurred. And this was written before those come, before Jesus was even born, though it was spoken about his coming. But they say that the scriptures, uh, well, these, the Daniel only wrote, whoever wrote Daniel, after the fact. Okay, but for us, the scriptures written in Daniel are the word of God, and we need to pay attention to them. For as believers in Jehovah, as believers in his son, Jesus Christ, we need to know that this is written for, long, for us and in, and in humble fear to hear it as the word of God and to uh, internalize it that we can live by it. What's the, the, what the prophets have written on the pages of the Bible need to be something that we read and pay attention to. I do want to read from Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. Okay. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other God. There is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. And Jesus also tells us, He's been given all authority in heaven and on earth. He is ruling. He's going to see to it that all that the Lord has spoken beforehand will be fulfilled. The Holy Spirit is working, that all that's been written beforehand will be fulfilled. This is something that God has said distinguishes him, Jehovah, from any other God. There is none like him that knows from the beginning the things to the end, and that he has spoken about them from the beginning, from times before through to the end. This is a proof of who he is. So we want to honor him with the fear of Jehovah, to honor him that this is something incredibly important to the, to the sanctification of his name. Okay. Now in chapter 10 of Daniel, verse 14, the divine man, that I think is the Lord himself, that came to Daniel, told him he came to explain to him the word that was revealed to Daniel. And that this word has to do with what will happen to Daniel's people, the Israeli Jewish people, in the latter days. The Messiah himself 
specifically tells us that what's written in Daniel, and more specifically in this chapter 11, has to do with the time of the end. And it's leading up to his coming again and to establish, establishing his kingdom, restoring his kingdom to Israel and over all the Gentile nations. So this future application for us living in this generation that's going to see these things, we need to pay attention to it. We might not be interested in past history, but we ought to be very interested in the future history, because it's going to happen in our generation. The Holy Spirit is giving many details to us so that we ourselves can be overcomers in the last days, so that we can be prepared to help others know what God is doing and why he's doing them. He's going to purify for himself a holy people, Israel. And he's purifying a spotless and blameless bride for the Lamb of God to rule and reign with him. Now, the 70 weeks prophecy tells us these are the objectives of God. This has not happened yet. So it might be hard for us to fathom, to take it in, but Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation, is still to come. And the question that Jesus asks us, all of us, do we love him in this adulterous and sinful generation? That's opposed to all that he stands for. Do we love him in such a generation as this? So let's also remember that the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of this image with all of these medals that represented these kingdoms, this image is still standing. It, is, it will stand until the Lord returns, this stone from heaven, the Son of Man coming back from heaven, to knock it all out, all the kingdoms that are opposed to him and to his kingdom, there, this, this, this image remains standing. Now here are a couple of pictures, just to help uh, remind us of what we're looking at here. We see this image of these four kingdoms and the stone coming down from heaven. It's picking up speed and it's going to demolish this image and all the kingdoms that it represents. There's also a picture here of some representations of Israel that's been reestablished in the past 100 years. How much the world powers were agreeing to give to the Jewish people to resettle in this land uh, legally, and how over these 100 years it's been diminished in size each time in the name of achieving peace. Well, there is no peace, and there's not going to be peace until the Lord returns. So until that time, these four kingdoms that were, and this image is still standing, they're all based in the Middle East, and today these kingdoms, we see their remnants in what was Babylon, today is Iraq. What was uh, Persia, uh, media Persia, is today Iran. What was Yavan, Greece, is today mostly Turkey. These are all modern nation states. Now, these four kingdoms, as we read in chapter 2 and in chapter 7, the, the metal kingdoms and the beast kingdoms, they're all leading to the final kingdom, the fourth, of the Antichrist, of this beast. So even Israel has been reestablished as a modern nation state. But instead of returning to her God and giving him glory, and praising him for bringing us back here and doing it, praise the Lord. They are seeking to achieve their own righteousness. Uh, all of these are going to fail. The Gentiles are going to fail, and the Jewish people are going to fail. As the Gentiles try to restore their kingdoms, they either have tried or are still trying, Israel is also trying to fulfill its own vision, its own dream, as it were but they will all fail because they're all seeking to attain their own righteousness and not to accept the righteousness of God. But praise the Lord, he is faithful to his covenant promises to his people, and they are assured through the crucifixion, the atoning death, and the resurrection of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. The promises of God through his covenants to his people Israel are secure. They're going to be to him be the glory, and to the Lamb upon the throne. Things will only work out for good God's way. 
We need to know that ourselves, okay? Here as believers in Jesus, as New, New Testament believers. Okay, so verse one in Daniel. As I said last week, I think this belongs to the end of chapter 10. This divine man is continuing to tell Daniel that even in the first year of Darius the Mede, he was there to strengthen him and to confirm him in his uh, rulership against those who were opposing him. Now Daniel was in captivity the entire 70 years of Jeremiah's prophecy, plus another two or three years into, into the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Uh, he served all of these kings and kingdoms faithfully from Nebuchadnezzar through Darius and even into to Cyrus because first of all, Daniel was faithful to his God. And he was a faithful and powerful witness that the God of Israel, the God of Daniel, is the most high God. And praise the Lord, he gave Daniel to hear the proclamation of Cyrus to let the Jewish people go back to the land, go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple and the city uh, after the 70 years of captivity. So verse two, the man says he's going to tell Daniel the truth about the word that was revealed to Daniel. The truth, he says here, there are going to be three more kings after Darius and a fourth will come who will be uh, richer than all the previous ones. And his power, his strength is in his wealth. And he's going to stir up trouble from all against the kingdom of Yavan, then the kingdom of Greece. Now the truth is not always easy to hear. Uh, there are some bad things in this truth. And Daniel was going to hear a lot of bad things. But the good was going to come after the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ to establish the kingdom of God with the saints. Daniel was prepared as a man of God, as a, as a mature man of God to hear this truth. And with Jehovah, the sweet will come to all those who remain with him, to who abide in him until the end, faithful to him, believing him, trusting him, loving him, the sweet will come. Now I'm going to tell you the truth also. There's lots of uh, confusion and controversy about the names, the identities, the dates of the kings of Persia during the second, second temple period. In the wisdom of God, which is higher than ours, he did not make it so clear. There have been many uh, researchers, academics, some faithful believers, They've all done their research, they've written books, they've written articles, they cannot and do not agree. So I'm not going to say what I think it is. It really obviously doesn't matter that much to God. His focus is on the last generation that's going to see the glorious return in great power and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ to establish the kingdom of God and put away all of this uh, opposition to him. Uh, we want to pay attention, therefore, to this chapter. He wants us to have hope in him. There's, there's great glory after the suffering of this world, just as Messiah had to suffer before he entered into his glory. He wants us to hope in him and to believe what he says. Now, God can act very quickly as the time nears for him to fulfill what he says he's going to do. Uh, look at all the Israel accomplished in the 72, 73 years. God has a timetable he's going to keep. As we read this chapter, it looks like this could take decades for all this to take place. Uh, but as you really actually read it, it doesn't look like there's a lot of time in between all the events being described here. God has been long suffering, but he does have a time that he has set that he's going to bring his word to pass at that time. And Jesus too has told us that the generation that sees the fig tree blossom, that is the Jewish people again back in the land of Israel as a, as a sovereign nation, the generation that sees this is going to see all these things take place. And Jesus had been quoting and referring to much of what is written here in this chapter 11 of Daniel. Okay, so verses three and four. 
It's written that a mighty king will arise and he will rule with much power and he will do what he wants. We're going to see this again in verse 36. He does what he wants. And his kingdom is going to be broken up and, and divided toward the four winds of heaven. That is in all the directions. Okay? It will not go to his descendants, not go to his uh, own posterity, but and the four that do uh, take the kingdom, the four parts of the kingdom, will not have the same strength as he had by himself, as he had alone. Okay, so we can see in these first four verses in chapter 11 that they pretty clearly descri describe there are th these three other kings and a fourth that are going to be kings of Persia, and then Alexander the Great is going to rise up and conquer them. Now, Alexander is the first king of the third kingdom of the image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the kingdom of bronze. He is the third beast described as a leopard with wings and four heads. As written, and these are written about in chapters two and seven. Okay, Greece defeated Persia in th the year 334 BC, almost two centuries after Daniel had died already. The Greek empire was divided after Alexander died in 323 BC and divided into four regional kingdoms. Four generals of Alexander who served him took over these four kingdoms. And from these four, two became prominent, Seleucus and Ptolemy. Seleucus is the, was, was the king of the north, the, 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 the northern kingdom, and Ptolemy, the kingdom of the king of the south, the king, the king of the south, the, 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 he's the, he was the king of the south. The Greek Empire uh, fell to Rome in 146 BC, and Antiochus Epiphanes eventually came out from the northern regional kingdom around Syria, Assyria. Okay? And he's famous, really we wouldn't know about him probably, if he hadn't fought the Maccabees between 167 and 165, and the result of that was that we have the, the, the celebration of Hanukkah every year to celebrate the victory of the Jewish people. But Jesus tells us that the central figure, figure in this chapter 11 is not Antiochus of past history, but the Antichrist of future history. Okay, chapter 11 is giving us many specific details of the fourth kingdom and the fourth beast. Okay. God is fulfilling, just continuing to give us what to know about the times of the end. Now, there are other references to the origin of the Antichrist or the little horn uh, that we read about earlier. I've just uh, uh, gave a clue to one of those areas. The Assyrian, okay, he's called the Assyrian, which was in the area of the Northern Kingdom. And we read about the Assyrian in Isaiah chapter 10 and in Micah chapter five. He's also spoken of as being Gog of Magog. We read about this in chapter 38 and 39 of Ezekiel. And it's clear from the description that Ezekiel is giving that uh, Magog is in Turkey. Okay. And it's north of Israel. And this again brings us to the other, another location. He's coming from the kingdom of the north. Not the west, but the kingdom of the north. And this we see again in Ezekiel 39 and in this chapter 11 of Daniel. Now, what motivates this antichrist and the false prophet against Jehovah, against Yeshua, Jesus, against the people in covenant relationship with God, the Jews, Israel, Christians, this, the spirit of the false prophet and the Antichrist is that they deny the true Jesus as being the Messiah and they deny the Father and the Son. Now, the two religions that concentrate the spirit are Judaism and Islam. In Judaism, they say there's a Messiah, but it is not Jesus. Okay? And in Islam, they say God is not a father and he has no son. This is 
maybe hard truths to hear, but it's the essence of the spirit that is in man. And uh, all of us need to repent and be saved by the grace and mercies of God. Now, understanding what is written in Daniel in the Old Testament is key for us to understand many of the prophecies that are given to us about the latter days, the last days, the end times in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul wrote about these things and he also referenced Daniel chapter 11 quite a bit. And he also said he declared the whole counsel of God. We need to do the same. We need to pay attention to what is written here. It's part of the whole counsel of God. It is written for us living at the end of the age and the book of Daniel is now open at the end of the age. It can be read and understood better than those who tried to understand it previously. We want to be able to help others know the true God and come under his authority willingly as well. We want to be victorious and the victorious one. So let us as a congregation, as Kailat Nachalat Yeshua, as Yeshua's inheritance congregation, let each one of us personally and as the body of Christ pay attention to the word of God, the words of the prophets written on the pages of the Bible. And let's, pr- let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I thank you again for the truth of your word and your word of truth. You strengthen our faith because you show us you fulfill your word. And you've done it so many times in the past, we can have confidence you will do it also in the future. You know everything. We want to participate with you in your great work. You're still working to save as many people as possible, as who will repent and believe the gospel. Help us to walk in the truth that you're giving us. Help us to believe your word as being true to us and to know how it affects us living in this generation. But thank you again. Thank you for uh, giving us the privilege of reading, of even having your word, and of reading it, and of the Holy Spirit helping us to make sense of it. Even where we can't make full sense, you give us enough to know that is truth. So we praise you, uh, and we thank you again for letting us share in the vic- victory of the victorious one forever and ever. In the name of this victorious one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Howard, for the message that we received from you, that you received from God. and. I want to really send you to this week to think about it, pray about it, pray about each other. And uh, if you have any thoughts, questions, or anything you want to share with us, in the end of the video, we will leave an email address that you'll be able to write us and we'll be happy to hear from you. So I want to bless you for the upcoming week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and with all of us. So we love you. We hope to see you soon and have a blessed week.
שבת שלום לכולם. תזכרו אלוהים אתכם, והוא מנצח. <laughs> 